The international working class movement has long been divided between two strategies to win socialism. One, the reformist, and the other, revolutionary. It was Rosa Luxemburg, a largely unknown immigrant from Poland in her 20s who kick-started this debate way back in the 1900s in Germany. She'd recently arrived in Germany from Poland and penned her thesis, Reform or Revolution. Her thesis was in response to one of the leaders of the German Social Democratic Party, Edward Bernstein. He argued that the revolutionary road to socialism was no longer necessary because the crisis of capitalism was over and that it could be reformed little by little. Reformists like Bernstein have argued that workers' parties must win a parliamentary majority, pass legislation to improve the lot of the working class, and bit by bit wrest power from the capitalist class. Probably sounds a bit familiar to a lot of us. This was the project of social democracy in the early 20th century, when it emerged as a mass force in European politics. Luxembourg's challenge was to remain on the revolutionary path, The SDP was a mass party and boasted a membership of a million. In one of their elections, they garnered almost one third of the national vote. All of the parties, of all the parties that could legislate socialism, you'd think this was the party. Luxembourg, however, attacked this line of thought, explaining that superficial and temporary changes to the economy did not constitute a fundamental break from the past. In her words, Those who declare themselves in favour of the method of legislative reform in place of and in contradistinction to the conquest of political power and social revolution do not choose a more tranquil, calmer and slower road to the same goal, but a different goal. So what Luxembourg is saying here is that to be effective, the fight for reform should not be severed from the final goal of socialism. Rather, day-to-day campaigns to improve life were the means by which the workers could then develop the confidence and organisational skills necessary for more fundamental, lasting change. Revolutionaries argue that workers' parties must overthrow the capitalist state and institute socialism from below, with insurgent workers establishing their own democratic institutions to run society. These two approaches aren't simply historic or academic questions. They are vital approaches in the way social movements address and can win. In the wake of the devastation of Cyclone Gabriel, the issue of climate justice and building a global movement that can win is not only essential, but really urgent now. In this talk, I want to argue for the necessity of approaching social movements with the lens of reform of revolution and pay particular attention to the movement for global climate justice and argue for a revolutionary approach rather than the reformist ones that we've seen so that we can rebuild and build a movement that can actually win. Most in the climate justice movement wouldn't identify with being socialist, let alone fighting for a socialist future. But the question of strategies does remain. Do we reform the system to fight for climate justice or do we do away with the system altogether? Perhaps the strongest argument for revolution is the very fact that three decades of reforms have amounted to absolutely nothing. The reforms have been completely ineffectual. They have been piecemeal, ineffective and the climate catastrophe has intensified. Capitalism's endless drive for growth and profit and fossil fuel-driven expansion is pushing the planet towards levels of global temperature increases that threaten life as we know it. Mass extinctions, many in the past 50 years, and habitat loss are a normal part of running this world. Waste continues to pile sky high, and Pacific Island communities face the prospect of their whole world disappearing under the sea. It needs to be reiterated, everything has gotten worse since the Kyoto Protocol signed in the late 1990s. Unlike three decades ago now, everyone, it seems, agrees that the climate crisis matters. From the fossil fuel companies themselves rebranding themselves to beyond petroleum, to the trade union movement, even to National Party MPs disciplining the likes of Maureen Pugh. But all of this has had no effect on emissions and things are getting worse. 
So how do we change? How do we get system change? One of the exciting developments in the recent student strikes is that it's not just revolutionaries who see the necessity of system change. Masses of people. At its height in Aotearoa in 2019, 170,000 school strikers and some 6 million students across the world marched for climate justice. Masses of people are beginning to question the priorities and the very logic of the system itself. A common slogan that was seen around the climate strikers was the demand for system change, not climate change. And while the political aspiration is clear, the politics has not been raised to meet the challenge of how we actualise this slogan. Many of the early leaders of the student strike are now absorbed into the reformist organisations, like the Green Party and other parliamentary politics. When you garner the praise from almost everyone in society, as the school strike did for a while, you threaten no one. With our anti-capitalist politics to ground this movement that has and can fall into the strategies and solutions that are permissible to the current rulers or the proponents of the status quo. Reformist organisations like the label The Greens try to come up with political and economic solutions that are permissible to the current status quo. Climate Minister and Green Party co-leader James Shaw's Zero Carbon Act that came into law in 2019 epitomises this economic solution. This was a framework engineered to keep emissions within 1.5 degrees. They congratulated themselves for being role models, in their words, to the rest of the world for being the first in the world to enshrine this framework into law. This was a framework, I have to say, was so weak that it garnered the support of both national and federated farmers, the peak farming body. The agricultural industry, particularly farming, all get to pat themselves on the back for being responsible for nearly half of New Zealand's total emissions, and yet in this act, these emissions aren't even part of the target. Any role modelling that Shaw can boast is about how to negotiate for absolutely nothing. Another weakness of this act is that even if there are companies that breach the enforced climate change targets of 2050, there's no mechanism, person or body that holds corporations or companies accountable. One could imagine that the new Climate Change Commission that was enacted could be that body, but they are only there as advisors to the government of the day, advice that the government can perfectly ignore if they want to. Green Party, Greenpeace, apologies, Executive Director Russell Norman put it this way, there's bark, but there's no bite. If there's no accountability or enforcement, we know companies will simply ignore this. Whatever credibility Labour and the Greens got for bringing in the Zero Carbon Act was quickly vaporised by the huge amount of spending on roads, which was announced the following year. They promised to spend up to $6.8 billion on transport infrastructure, of which roads were given $5 billion of that. That's just over 70% of the transport budget on road usage. Public transport, rail, cycling, walking, all the environmentally friendly transportational options get the remaining scraps. So the biggest contributing industries to climate change, agriculture and transport, remain unchallenged and unchanged. After Cyclone Gabrielle too, it's more than ironic that the government has just indicated that they will go back to building more roads instead of cycleways, bus lanes and other infrastructure that were initially planned to tackle climate change. More roads for more climate change and more cyclones. Biggest belief. Back to the Zero Carbon Act, I haven't quite finished with this one, because the toothlessness of this act does not come as a surprise to revolutionaries. This is not about sure being not brave enough or too conservative or the Greens caving into farming and business interests. This is precisely the politics of reformism at play. For reformists, they accept the very logic of the confines of change that the current structures places them in. Instead of trying to overthrow those structures, they limit their demands to those very confines that have exacerbated and are massive contributors to the climate crisis in the first place. So for them, this is a win. This is a win. But why is this? A key feature of reformists, reformists is that they venerate and idolise the state with parliament at its highest expression. They also see the state as a neutral body that can be captured by the progressive left. Both these concepts are profoundly misguided. 
The state is not neutral, and parliament is not the controlling institution reformists imagine it to be. Several elements of the state apparatus are far more powerful than parliament and repeatedly frustrate democracy. Marxists see the state as a coercive institution, and its purpose is to enforce the rule of one class over others. It monopolizes the means of organized violence through the police, the army, the courts, and prisons to secure the domination of the ruling class. Capital states depend on the ongoing flow of profits to finance these bodies. This is why politicians elected government very quickly come to understand that protecting the economy is one of their fundamental responsibilities. And protecting the economy necessarily means protecting profits and the status quo. And then there are all the arms of the state that loyally serve the capitalist class. The armed forces, far from defending the nation, defend the interests of those with money. The armed forces have historically, and, and until now, continued to play a role in expelling Māori off their whenua, off their land. The police's main role is to protect the property of the rich. If you doubt that, look at the way they respond to any picket lines or strikes or demonstrations by making sure that they have little no, or no impact on business as usual, through brutal force if necessary. The courts also serve the interests of the capitalists. Workers who steal from their boss can be thrown into prison, while bosses who systematically steal from their workers are at best given a slap on the wrist. Get in a box! This doesn't mean that the state Get is merely a, box. a puppet of the capitalists. It does enjoy some autonomy, and there can be tensions at times between it and different factions of the capitalist class. We saw this during the COVID years, where the import-based industries like tourism, private education and the likes were braying for the orders to be opened, while the health and other sectors were calling for precautionary public health-based approaches. These can arise from the fact that the state has to balance the interests of capitalists competing against each other, the better to do what is best for New Zealand capitalism as a whole. And occasionally, if the working class is demanding reforms through strikes and riots, the state can be forced to make concessions in order to defuse the conflict and stabilise the system in the long term. So while the state is not a mere puppet, it does work intimately with and within the capitalist class and in its interests. Even if we manage to elect the best politicians, the state is still not a place where the working class or the environmental reforms can be worked through legislation by legislation. For a start, the most important elements of the capitalist state are unelected. People like judges, the public service bureaucrats, the generals, the police commissioners. Trying to use parliament to undermine core parts of the oppressor's apparatus won't work. The ruling class is not full of naive idiots. They won't let you purge the state bureaucracy, disarm the police, sack the generals and disband the army just because you've won an election. Parliamentary elections are also not a neutral battleground. It's true that we all have one vote, but the way parliamentary elections are organised only muffles workers' class demands. We have no say over what we do and can't remove them until uh, what they do, and they can't be removed until three years later. Voting in parliamentary elections is a passive activity which does not require workers to be active participants in determining their own future. And even when sincere reformist politicians do manage to get elected, they face insistent right-wing media pressure day after day, while workers get a chance to vote only every three years. The result is that the vast majority of radical politicians who have gone into Parliament have capitulated and become loyal defenders of the status quo. It is they who are reformed rather than the state. The rare minority who have not given in to these pressures are either expelled or relegated to the margins of the party as eccentrics. These are all important obstacles to any reforming government. But even without these problems, simply passing reforms in Parliament is not enough to create a better world where people's needs are at the heart of the decisions being made. At best, we would have more generous welfare state, more public ownership. It would still be a capitalist economy and a capitalist state. Workers would still be exploited and alienated from any control over running of their workplaces and society and would be at the mercy of the market. And it is the control of industry that gives the capitalist class ample means to undermine and even destroy any government it disapproves of. 
It's not individual consumption that is so detrimental to environment. The degradation happens at the point of production, the very point that workers are not giving any control or say over. What should we produce as a society? For whom? To what end? How much? What of the revolutionary approach? We need a collective systematic change to put halt to this environmental crisis. One that has anti-capitalist politics at its heart. And one that stops the very impulses of the system. Profit, profit, and more profit. This isn't simply a historical academic question, but a vital one to get right in order to fight for our planet. While a successful revolution is the ultimate goal of revolutionaries, this doesn't mean rejecting struggles for reforms and simply waiting for a revolution to happen. In fact, revolutionaries fight fiercely for reforms, whether that's to raise the minimum wage, defeat anti-union laws, or improve access to abortion. We try to be involved in as many social struggles that challenge the status quo that we can. The difference lies in the way revolutionaries fight for reforms, as opposed to the reformists like Labour or the Greens. First, in every campaign, revolutionaries want to push mass struggle to the forefront. When large numbers of people are involved, whether through striking or demonstrating or taking other sorts of action, it provides direct experience of fighting and in the right circumstances gives workers and the oppressed a sense of their own power. This gives such struggles the potential to escalate into broader challenges to the system or short of that provides important experiences to workers for future struggles. Mass involvement also makes it harder for politicians or governments to resolve things behind closed doors, so it increases the chances that real concessions can be forced from the powerful. That is, it is a more effective method for winning reforms than being hostage to the benevolence of the electoral cycle. Mass struggles are vital for workers to gain confidence in their ability to run society. They throw off attitudes of subservience and apathy and reactionary prejudices. Socialism must be consciously created by the collective action of millions of workers in the course of revolutionary struggles, but such upsurges are inherently episodic and can't be conveniently timed to fit in with election timetables. Mass upsurges in struggle lead to rising levels of confrontation with the capitalist order and can lead to the formation of workers' councils, an alternative form of power to the capitalist class. Workers' councils are massively more democratic than any parliament. In workers' councils, delegates are directly subject to the will of the workers who elected them and can be replaced at any time, reflecting rapid changes in political consciousness. Workers themselves debate and carry out the decisions of these revolutionary bodies. Only mass struggle can create new revolutionary and democratic institutions. That struggle must end with those institutions overthrowing the capitalist state if the working class is to take power and reorganise society. Revolutionaries can't ma magic up revolutionary upheaval into existence. They arise when a deep crisis in the system provokes workers to move into struggle. At the start of that struggle, most workers and students won't see their actions as a direct challenge to capitalism. But as the struggle unfolds and in response to ruling class attacks, the movement can spread, creating more strikes, more workplace occupations, and even a general strike. Militant workers can set up democratic organisations such as the Cordones, as we saw in Argentina, to coordinate the struggle. A situation of dual power emerges. The task of revolutionaries is to push that struggle to its limits, to combat the reformist argument and try to win the leadership of the workers' committees and convince workers these committees should be the ones to take power. Overthrowing the capitalist order can seem a daunting task, but there are no easier options. The reformist approach offers no way out, and reformists simply prop up the existing order. We've seen three decades of inaction of global emissions globally. It's true that a socialist revolution is unlikely to occur in a wealthy nation like New Zealand, and will generally start in the weaker links of the world system, such as in Sudan recently. But success in one country can inspire revolts elsewhere, Revolutions repeatedly come in waves, starting as early as the revolutions of 1848, continuing through the revolts of the late 1960s and most recently the Arab revolutions. But this is a global system, as we can see with inflation globally at the moment. Crisis is one part of the world effects 
when one part of the world affects other parts. Internationalism isn't wishful thinking. In 1917, Russia was that weak link. The revolution there inspired a wave of revolts that swept across Europe and much of the rest of the world. Today, we live in an even more integrated world capitalist system than in 1917. This increases the potential for revolutions to spread and to spread quickly. The task for socialists in Aotearoa today is to build an organisation that can intervene in struggles and push them forward to help lay the foundations of a revolutionary party that can be decisive in future revolts. The mass mobilisation we've seen initiated and organised by students to call out the inaction of climate change is inspiring. But we need more than mobilisations. We need anti-capitalist cap- politics and a vision to see a society that puts people at the, its heart rather than profits. In an election year, we need to be confident in our arguments against reformism, which is, in all its numerous varieties, help maintain the rule of the rich and powerful.